Hi, I'm Carol Greenberg, and this is my co-host, Andy Greenberg. Well, hi, Carol, and hi, everybody. How are you today? I know you can't answer me, and I know I hate when I ask people that question. But anyway, I hope you're doing as well as we are. Are you doing okay today? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. And <laughs> it dawned upon us that of all the times we spent together, we've never really talked a lot about Israel. So today I thought we'd cover some things about Israel that you never knew, and that by the end of our discussions and some of our videos, you are once again gonna be going back to your Hebrew school t teacher and your Hebrew school principal, and you're going to say the following. Give me a refund. <laughs> because you didn't teach me everything. And that's the pleasure of Carol and I doing this for everybody, because yes, it is never too late to learn things. And today it's all about Israel and you'll be shocked. So let's begin. We've been to Israel. How many times have you been to Israel? I think we've been there about- well, I've been there five times. And You've I've been, been there, there six times. Maybe even more. I don't think so, six okay. times. And I was there the very first time when I was young, I was at a kibbutz. And you know what they did? They spoke Hebrew in Israel. They speak two languages there, right? Which yes, ones? English and Hebrew. And some of the signs are also in Arabic. So here's my very first question. Let's see if you know the answer. No, I'm not gonna ask you to speak Hebrew. At what time in Israeli history did Hebrew become the official language? When did the Jews begin to speak Hebrew in Israel? And what do you think? When do you think that happened? I don't know. I would think it was a long time ago when I, I don't know, I don't have a clue. And how about you, do you know? Well, we're gonna show you a little video, then we're gonna talk about it. And you will be amazed as to what the history of Hebrew is in Israel. So if you're ready, so are we as we get this started for you. Separable. But what's crazy is that for millennia, spoken Hebrew... Well, we have a problem because we don't have the sound. Hold on one second, and I don't understand why we don't have the sound, because maybe we're not able to hear it from here. So bear with me one second, I apologize. We did test this out, and do I have it? Yes, I have it right, I have it there. So let me see something. I apologize. And let's see if we can hear it now. Hebrew was an all but dead language. Sure, the Bible, prayers, and religious texts were written and read in Hebrew, but nobody spoke it in daily life. So how did an almost extinct biblical language become the mother tongue of world Jewry in the span of only a few decades, something that had never happened in the history of language? And what role did a radical linguistic revolutionary named Eliezer ben Yehuda play in their miraculous rebirth of Hebrew? Let's go back, like way back. In the Bible, the Jews, otherwise known as Hebrews, spoke an ancient, well, more biblical version of Hebrew. Biblical Hebrew remained the native tongue of Jews for over a thousand years, but Hebrew as a spoken language began to die out around the year 70. That's the year the Romans destroyed the second Jewish temple in Jerusalem and exiled a vast number of Jewish people from Israel. And Hebrew as a spoken language really kicked the bucket about 65 years later in 135 after the failure of the Bar Kokhba revolt when Roman Emperor Hadrian expelled, enslaved, or killed most of Israel's remaining Jews, the final native Hebrew speakers. So that should have been the end of Hebrew, right? Well, no. Hebrew as a spoken language was dead, but the few Jews left in Israel continued using Hebrew in the study of Torah, but, and this is key, they only used it as a written literary language. According to Lewis Glinner in his book, The Story of Hebrew, reading Hebrew became a sort of spiritual resistance by Jews against the Roman oppressors. By the turn of the second century, Aramaic had become the commonly used language of the Middle East, but Hebrew as a written language for Torah study still persisted. And at the turn of the third century, Rabbi Judah the Prince, then the leader of the small remaining Israeli Jewish community, was determined to give written Hebrew an even better shot at survival. He decided that he would exclusively use Hebrew in his editing of the Mishnah, the compilation of Jewish law, and the basis for the Talmud. His very deliberate choice to codify Hebrew as the language of the Mishnah kept written Hebrew alive. But by the sixth century, Hebrew's use for Torah study was very limited. This is when the Talmud, the encyclopedic work forming the basis of all Jewish law, was composed. It was a whopping 5,400 or so pages in mostly Aramaic. Still though, Hebrew held on. 
Medieval scholars wrote their commentaries on the Bible and Talmud in Hebrew, from Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, or Rashi, in France, to Rabbi Avraham Ibn Ezra in Spain. Maimonides, the 12th century leader of the Jewish community in Egypt, wrote his Mishnah Torah, or Code of Law, in Hebrew, covering every detail of Jewish observance. Okay, we've got the ancient and medieval history covered, so it's time to talk about Eliezer ben Yehuda, who resurrected Hebrew as a spoken language in its modern form, right? Not so fast. The revival of Hebrew... So, when do you actually think that Hebrew became a language? That's the important part, because right now we could see that maybe it wasn't. So, you'll be surprised as to what these years come out to be. Hebrew as a modern language actually started well before his time, with one period often overlooked. The 18th century saw the Age of Enlightenment, during which the study of language rose in popularity. And Hebrew is no exception. In fact, many Christians obsessed over Hebrew, regarding it as a classical language akin to Latin, as you can see from some of the emblems of Ivy League schools. So, I don't know if you knew this, but a lot of the Ivy League schools, as we see here, have the Hebrew written into them. And that includes Yale, and if I remember right, that includes Dartmouth. Here, they have the name of God directly from the Torah. And El Shaddai is another Hebrew name for God. So let's continue on. These are Ivy League schools, by the way. Some of America's founders were well-versed in Hebrew as well. James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, chief among them. Did you know that, that Alexander Hamilton and the other presidents actually knew some Hebrew, James Madison? Not only that, but during many times where they had speeches for the graduation, the valedictorians who were not Jewish actually spoke Hebrew and gave their speeches in Hebrew. This is before modern day time right here in the United States. And I think some of you might have known, I don't know if you knew this or not, what? but you have probably have to come a little what? bit closer. I don't know if you knew this or not, but it became the, the time that they were trying to discuss what language was going to be used in America. There were two languages that were up for discussion. Which languages do you think they were? Well, based on what you're talking about now, maybe Latin and Hebrew? Uh, Latin and Hebrew? Or no. English and Hebrew. English and Hebrew. And Hebrew came in second place. Wow. Yep. How about that? Let's continue. In 1783, secular Jewish intellectuals, part of the Jewish Enlightenment movement known as the Haskalah, started a Hebrew language periodical called Hamasef. Their goal was to spread the language and demonstrate its beauty. By publishing Hebrew language newspapers distributed to tens of thousands, they furthered a new Hebrew style closely tied to the vernacular and very different from old school rabbinic Hebrew. So while this new Hebrew 2.0 was still mainly literary, it was now used to write about all sorts of mundane things, not just the Bible. Okay, enough about reading and writing Hebrew. When and how did Hebrew actually become a spoken language? Care to guess? Um... Care to guess? Remember, it hasn't been a spoken language yet. Nope. Well, in the late 19th century, the Zionist movement began to take shape. And amongst cultural Zionists, as opposed to Theodore Herzl's more political Zionism, Hebrew was a way to return to their ancient Jewish roots. But modern Hebrew still faced some major hurdles. One of them was Yiddish. Yiddish wasn't just the spoken language of most European Jews. It was How many of you know Yiddish? As you know, I don't know any Yiddish. I don't know. I know the, the phrases they use, the my to this, that. But I don't know any Yiddish. Now, when your grandparents or parents came they over, knew, they all knew they Yiddish. All knew Yiddish. My, my mother's whole family knew Yiddish. My father's family knew Yiddish. Yep. I did not know Yiddish. All right. It was their mother tongue, their way of life. The Hebrew pioneers themselves didn't start off speaking Hebrew. Imagine these Yiddish speakers struggling to use a language in their daily life that must have sounded terribly formal and stilted. It'd be like trying to order a pizza in Latin. And there were more than a fair share of Zionist leaders who didn't have much faith in the resurrection of Hebrew. Moshe Lilienblum, a pre-Herzl Zionist leader, actually said Hebrew's time was up. Hmm. Herzl himself even thought German was the natural choice for Zionism. Can you imagine going on El Al Airlines and they announced in German that they're about to land in Tel Aviv? Can you imagine going into a kosher butcher in Israel or a restaurant in Israel and speaking German? No, I can't imagine that. Here we go. After all, he said, who knows enough Hebrew to buy a train ticket? And of course, there were the Ashkenazi Orthodox Jews, many of them Hasidim, who still held firm in their belief that Hebrew should only be used for holy topics like Torah study and prayer. What do you think about that? Should they have limited Hebrew 
to strictly biblical and Torah study? Or should it be released as a language for Jewish people to talk to each other? Because remember, at this point, they didn't speak Hebrew to each other. I think it should have been released as a language. Hmm, a holy language? The language of the Jews. So when you study the Torah and all of a sudden you speak Hebrew by saying, I want some ice cream, do you think that it's proper to use glida, which is the Hebrew word for ice cream? Do you think it's, it's proper to I do that? I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Let's see. Even more so, now that modern Hebrew had become associated with secularism and Zionism, things they were not huge fans of. So all in all, the opportunity to revive spoken Hebrew seemed quite slim. And then there's Eliezer ben Yehuda. Born Eliezer Yitzchak Perelman, he believed the future of the Jews required both their own land and their own language. And so here's where it becomes very interesting. Watch the story of one man, one man. Hebrew was the way to unite Jews across the globe. Eliezer's obsession with Hebrew started as a child in Europe when his yeshiva teacher secretly introduced him to secular Hebrew literature, such as the works of Achad Am, a leader of the cultural Zionist movement we spoke about earlier. Eliezer also discovered that in rare cases, when two Jewish communities that spoke different languages, say Yiddish and Arabic, needed to correspond with each other, they would sometimes use a form of medieval Hebrew as a common language. This strengthened his resolve, and in 1881, he packed his bags and made the trek to Palestine. Adopting the biblical-sounding name Eliezer ben Yehuda, he and his wife established the world's first strictly speaking Hebrew household in almost 2,000 years, and soon Whoa, produced the world's first... Let's go ahead and absorb that. In the 1800s, he became the first family in the world to speak Hebrew in his household for 2,000 years. Well, that means he must have invented some of the words. Let's find out. First native Hebrew speaker in almost 2,000 years, their son, Ben Sion. Now, it's easy to criticize how Ben Yehuda raised Ben Sion in a home that spoke a language no one else was using. But sometimes it takes a little bit of crazy to create profound change. The experiment got off to a rough start. By the age of four, Ben Sion still wasn't talking, and Ben Yehuda was so obsessed with proving that Hebrew could exist as a modern daily language. Carol, do you remember the first words our son said? Yes, I do. How old was he? He was uh, 19 months old. 19 months old. He wouldn't talk, and we yeah, were worried. I actually hadn't even said mom or dad. We Nothing. were getting concerned. So one day we're sitting at home, and he did this in English. I'm not leading to the fact that he did it in Hebrew. So one day we're sitting at home, we're having dinner, and I believe we were having hamburgers. And maybe french fries, and french obviously. Fries. And then all of a sudden, the first word spoken by our son was... Please pass the ketchup. And we looked around to see who said that. And not only were his first words, it was in complete sentence. That's right. He wow. actually prevented Ben Sion from playing with other kids to avoid any corruption of his Hebrew. Ben Sion later wrote that his father wouldn't let him listen to the chirping of birds or the neighing of horses, since they didn't do it in Hebrew. <laughs> Maybe an exaggeration, but Ben Yehuda wasn't messing around. Ben Yehuda's friends and colleagues were telling him to give up, but suddenly the kid's first word finally came, Abba, Daddy. Ben Yehuda wrote in his diary that there was now no room for doubt that Hebrew could become the spoken language of a community. But how do you make this change happen? Ben Yehuda believed the key was to use it as the language of instruction in schools. Hebrew wouldn't just be a subject studied, it would be the language used to teach all other subjects, like math and history. The first all-Hebrew elementary school was founded in 1899, and within 10 years, the number of all-Hebrew schools grew to 20, with 2,500 students. Ben Yehuda argued that Hebrew would become a living language by moving from the schools into the home, and his work convinced many secular nationalist Jews of the same thing. In 1890, Ben Yehuda founded the Vad HaLashon, or the Language Council, which still exists to this day as the Academy of the Hebrew Language. The council published bulletins and dictionaries, coining thousands of words you don't find in the Torah, like doll, ice cream, and bicycle. Not everywhere he invented caught on, but Ben Yehuda took it upon himself to keep the language growing. Like we mentioned earlier, Theodore Herzl, the founder of political Zionism, initially preferred German to Hebrew as the language for Israel. But he soon reversed his position, even embracing Hebrew while embarrassed that he could not speak it. After his death, the Zionist Congress officially declared Hebrew the language of Zionism. The language spread through schools and homes in Israel and developed through trial and error. But Eliezer ben Yehuda had achieved his goal. Shortly before ben Yehuda died in 1922, Britain officially recognized Hebrew as the language of Palestine's Jewish inhabitants. 1922. Did you catch that? Now, what do you think so far? I think it's 
an amazing story. And as you said, one man got everybody to change their thinking. One man. 26 years later, Israel became an official Hebrew speaking state. So 26 years from 1922 no, is 1948. In 19, am I right? No. 1922 and 22 years. Yes, 1948. In nine, something like that. 19 in the 1940s. Something like that. In the 1940s. Okay. Only in the 1940s. But just like the story didn't begin with Ben Yehuda, it certainly doesn't end there either. He became the face of the movement that there was still a lot of work to be done. While Ben Yehuda invented about 150 words. When do you think the first dictionary came out? The first Hebrew dictionary. What do you think? Well, if that was invented in 1922, I don't know, maybe a couple of years later. All right, what do you think? Now, phone a friend, here's the answer. His son, Bencion, and others came up with thousands more. In fact, the first Hebrew dictionary wasn't completed until 1959, wow. 11 years after Israel was founded. Did you catch that? The first Hebrew dictionary in 1959. And just think about the fields of medicine, science, and law. Entire dictionaries needed to be written to cover new concepts that hadn't even existed when the Bible was written. Men like Dr. Aaron Meyer Mazia took on the task of advising Ben Yehuda during his life and continued his work after his death. By the time of Israel's establishment, over 90% of Israeli kids under 15 were already fluent in Hebrew. With refugees pouring in from all over the world at that time, the need for a common language was front and center. Hebrew was still battling Yiddish as a popular language, but many in Israel's booming immigrant population considered Yiddish a language of exile and a reminder of things they'd rather forget. With the new state founded, Israeli leaders wanted to cement an Israeli identity, and they knew Hebrew was a key ingredient needed to bond them all together. Ben Gurion went so far as suppressing Yiddish from being used in any public role, using a well-organized political system to force Hebrew usage through its comprehensive services to the immigrant masses. Schools were in Hebrew, youth movements were in Hebrew, compulsory military service was in Hebrew, political leaders Hebraicized their names. David Gruen became David Ben-Gurion. Golda Meyerson became Golda Meir. And thus, Hebrew as a language finally won. So it would seem like Eliezer Ben Yehuda was responsible in many ways for reviving and modernizing Hebrew. But it took an entire people over many centuries to ensure that he would be able to accomplish this feat. So while we usually credit Ben Yehuda with single-handedly bringing Hebrew back to life, it's really more complicated than that. As Zionist leader Menachem Usishkin later said of Ben Yehuda, the people needed a hero, so we gave them one. Still, it was Ben Yehuda who steered the language past the array of obstacles facing it in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Remember, not everyone wanted it to succeed. If Herzl had his way initially, Israelis would be speaking German. Doesn't sound right, does it? So, can your average American teenager read and understand a 300-year-old English manuscript without help? Unlikely. But any Hebrew speaker can open up a 3,000-year-old Hebrew text and make sense of it, religious or not. Hebrew's rebirth returned a common language to an ancient people, and its revival also helped lead to the miracle of Israel's rebirth. Jews now have both a land and a language, just as Ben Yehuda envisioned. Thanks for watching. See you guys next week. Whoa! What do you think of that, Carol? We're going to talk into that. Okay. I what think, do you think of that? I think that's amazing. But I, I just, the last statement that he made that um, Ben Gurion, you know, even though he started it, wasn't, was giving credit, but, but it took everybody else. And I understand that, but I don't think the credit should be taken away. I agree with you. All right. So there we have one little story about Hebrew. Now, let me ask you a question. Did Jews get along? Just like every other people. Everybody argues. Do Jews believe in idols? No, we don't. We don't? Don't believe in idols? Oh, uh, we did a long time ago. How long ago? When the whole Moses thing happened. Yeah, with the golden calf? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you believe that that was the only time the golden calf was ever used in Judaism? If you do... No, I don't. I know there's a story there vaguely <laughs> behind there. Ah, uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, that story has to do with the formation of Israel, things you probably never knew before. So let's, we're going to go back into history. And when we go back into history, we're going to be looking at how the Hebrew, uh, how Israel, in fact, was torn apart. And this is called a kingdom of Israel. Pardon me, the kingdom of Israel, how it, in fact, was destroyed and why we are the way we are today. So watch this video, this will also surprise you.
And here we go. The Jewish kingdom, a glorious simpatico of majesty, nobility, justice, and holiness. The Jewish equivalent of King Arthur's Camelot spliced with the Vatican. Take, for instance, uh, war, uh, idolatry, uh, murdering of prophets, civil war. Uh, by the way, who do you think murdered the prophets? I was going to say some, some Jewish people, the Roman, the whatever. Which one? I don't know. The Roman. No? Uh, okay, maybe the legendary Jewish kingdom did have some problems. How did what was once supposed to be the divinely gifted Jewish nation fall apart? So, after Moses died, the Jewish people conquer and then settle the land of Canaan under the leadership of Joshua. The Jews officially become Israelites with their newfound residence and divide up the land by tribe. There's Asher and Naphtali in the north, Don, Benjamin, and Judah in the south. Menashe and God found a plush piece of land on the east side of the Jordan and decided to settle outside the borders of the kingdom. Point is, everybody kind of just keeps to themselves for a while. Wait a minute, do you remember seeing that map? Yes. Yeah, what did that map remind you of, by the way? What, what, what did that map remind you of? I don't know. How about the United States when it was first formed? Oh, you mean the 13 colonies? Yeah. There the, here there are 12. Right. But look at that. Manasseh, and Naphtali, Asher, God, Benjamin, or Benjamin, Don, or Dan. And, and what does that all mean? That means they divide, even though they're one people, they divide it up just like the United States did so many hundreds of years later. I wonder where they got the idea of the United States to divide it into territories. Outside the borders of the kingdom. Point is, everybody kind of just keeps to themselves for a while. Not a bad thing. Just a loose confederation of states, if you will. Not too much central leadership except for the judges, not the black robe and gavel type of judge, but spiritual leaders who arose to whip the Jews back into shape when they got lax and maybe a little war here and there. Now that was by design, a system to maximize personal responsibility and empower the individual. Idealistic, utopian, truly a freedom worth cherishing. But then the Jewish people say, Wouldn't that be a great country to live in? Yeah. Nice and peaceful, everything good, just like the, the, the Torah and Moses and God envisioned. But wait. Wait. There's more. You know what would be nice? To be ruled by a king. I guess they were looking around and they saw all their neighbors with their frou-frou and their crowns and their glorious robes and they thought, I want a piece of that. So, the prophet Samuel anoints an Israelite named Saul and he's good, reigning for about two years or 20, depending on whether you're going by the Bible or the historian's guesstimate. But who's counting? Saul is succeeded by King David, who loves bullying overgrown barbarians. Of course, that was Goliath. ...and writing poetry. This brings us to Solomon, the wisest of all men, who according to Jewish tradition is the author of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs, inventor of the infant bisecting... You remember the uh, inventor of the bisecting maternity test? Yes, because he, you know, they were, two women were fighting over babies and one wanted to divide them in half, etc., etc. Right. Yes. Maternity test, and most notably, the builder of Solomon's temple. Imagine the elegance of Buckingham Palace, the beauty of the Sistine Chapel, and the magnitude of the pyramids, with shorter lines than Disney World. Yes, Israel finally had its wonder of the world, where the priests conducted the daily sacrifices and drew the presence of God onto the earth. It was King Solomon's crowning achievement. But it wasn't cheap. That's okay. We'll let the next guy worry about the budget deficit. Enter the next guy. That sound familiar? Budget deficit and taxation? Sounds familiar. How do you think they paid for it? Budget deficit and taxes. Let's see how that worked out. Rehoboam. Solomon's son, King Rehoboam, ascends the throne, and right off the bat, he gets hit with complaints from the ten northern tribes. See, in order to build that temple, Solomon had to raise taxes and enforce labor. But now that the temple was complete, the ten northern tribes didn't think it was unreasonable to ask for a tax cut. Rehoboam consulted his advisors. Now, he has two sets of counsel. There's the old, wizened, and weathered elders who served his father. Their suggestion? Ease up and speak to them gently, and they will be your servants forever. Or he could listen to his young, upstart advisors who felt he should show them who's boss. Who would you have listened to, the, uh, the wise people or the younger people that said, you show them who's boss? Who would you have listened to? Probably show them who's boss. Guess which one he chose. 
Rehoboam comes down hard, proclaiming, quote, My father chastised you with whips, I will chastise you with scorpions. Pretty good for a king, huh? So the northern tribes Brexit, forming the northern kingdom of Israel. One of Solomon's former ministers, Jeroboam, receives a prophecy that he, not Rehoboam, would be the next king. Having led the Israelites in asking for the reduced tax burden, he takes... By the way, doesn't that sound like the civil war the United States went through when you had a whole bunch of states and all of a sudden Israel gets divided into two sections? ...takes up the charge to rebel and becomes king of the north. Meanwhile, Rehoboam is left with the southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, known as the kingdom of Judah. So if Saul was anointed in 879 BCE and Rehoboam got his shot at kingship in 796, it took less than a century for four kings to screw up the country. So did the trial separation help? No, not at all. On a religious level, they both falter. In the north, Jeroboam doesn't like that Judah has the temple. So Jeroboam makes his own temple, actually two of them, one in the tribe of Don and one in Bethel. But he decides to go a little off brand. Wait a minute. What do you see here, Carol? I see an idol. What what is what kind of an idol does it look like? It looks like a lion. No. What is it? Try again. Uh can and choosing for his mascot the golden cat uh, bull. Golden cat. Golden cat. When you're trying to make a name for yourself, don't pick your nation's all-time biggest failure. In the South, Rehoboam isn't doing much better. He has about 17 years where he forsakes Bible law and suffers attacks from the Egyptians and the Ethiopians. Oh, and all the alliances that have been built with surrounding countries, the Philistines, the Moabites, the Edomites, they're out. Following the split are a cascade of reigning kings, all with varying degrees of success, scandals, overthrows, and wars. Sound familiar? In the North, Jeroboam dies and his son takes over, but then he's killed by one of his army officers. Oh, Jew killing Jew, kings being assassinated. They go through a few more reigns as one military commander kills the king, assumes the throne, and then is killed by another army general. Usurp, rinse, repeat. We land on Omri in 884, who's an effective ruler, increasing trade and commerce, and even ambitiously builds a Jerusalem of the north, Samaria, with not a temple, but a glorious citadel, making it his new capital. But possibly his most famous act is marrying off his son Ahab to the Phoenician princess Jezebel. Have you heard Jezebel before? Yes. We'll come back to this. Back in the South, it's pretty much the same sort of marching monarch conga line. Eventually, a man named Asa assumes the throne of the South, and rather than murder or war his way to securing power, he makes the country pull a spiritual 180, ridding the southern kingdom of idols. He even takes his grandmothers. That's courage. So, Asa is one of the few kings the Bible actually praises. But does that help him in his continual wars against the North? Not really, as the Northern Kingdom's troops actually come as close as five miles from taking Jerusalem. And Doesn't it sound that way when Israel attacked Assyria and were five miles away from Damascus and pulled up? Asa is forced to turn to Damascus for help, offering gold and silver from the temple and his own palace. King Ben-Hadad I attacks from around Damascus, what today would be known as Syria, forcing the North to retreat in crushing defeat. The whole Jewish civil war jumps the shark when Ahab and Jezebel are confronted by the prophet Elijah for their appalling institutionalization of idolatry throughout Israel. The Book of Kings even goes so far as to call Ahab the worst king thus far. These names may sound familiar, as all three have persisted in Jewish and popular culture. Ahab is the main character of Herman Melville's Moby Dick and an obscure X-Men villain. But fiction can't compare to fact in the magnitude of evil as he and his wife rounded up and murdered over 300 Jewish prophets. See that? It wasn't the enemy that killed the Jewish prophets. It was their own people. It was their own people, the kings. And brought idolatry back to the land. And what does the Torah say about idolatry? Uh-uh. Yeah, what does the Jews say about idolatry? Bring me more. As wicked as Ahab was, Jezebel was the ringleader. She despised the tenets of Judaism and wished to wipe out God from the kingdom of Israel once and for all. In addition to the prophet purge, she framed a law-abiding landowner, executing him to seize his land. She incited her husband to build an altar to the Canaanite god Baal in the Sumerian capital and had him bring in 450 priests to the pagan deity Baal and another 400 to the pagan god Asherah. So on all of those idols. On the evil scale of that food critic from Ratatouille to Thanos, She's somewhere between Maleficent and the guy who came up with alternate side parking tickets. Jezebel was the ultimate temptress, frequently referenced in pop culture to this day, in songs, movies, TV, and the self-proclaimed, supposedly feminist website, Jezebel.com. 
When the prophet Elijah first confronts the duo, he foretells of a two-year drought, which indeed comes to pass, plaguing the land. As he labors to hide the few remaining prophets, Ahab and Jezebel only grow more wrathful, refusing to repent. After three years, Elijah has had enough and proposes a showdown. Whoa, big stage? showdown. Here it oh, comes. Carl. The audience? All the Jews of Israel. This is almost like the beginning of Gunsmoke, and I'm not kidding. The challenge. The 450 priests of Baal would make an offering on their altar, while Elijah alone would make an offering to the Jewish God. No fire, no burning incense. Whoever's God comes down from heaven and consumes the offering first would be the winner. The priests of Baal set up their altar and beseech their god for the better part of an afternoon while Elijah waits, cool, calm, and collected. The priests grow desperate, screaming to their god and even cutting themselves, hoping the blood and affliction would rouse their sleeping deity, but no response. Elijah then begins to mock, Shout louder! Maybe your god is chatting with his other god friends. Maybe he stepped out for a coffee. Maybe he's having a godly afternoon nap. I'm paraphrasing. When the priests give up, Elijah confidently douses water in his offering, not once, not twice, but thrice, and even has a ditch full of more water dug to stifle any possible flame that might ignite his sacrifice from the ground level. This guy knows how to put on a performance. Then, in front of the massive crowd, Elijah prays to the God of the Jewish people. Within seconds, a pillar of fire shoots down from the heavens, consuming the offering, the pyre, the stone altar, and even the mode of water. The audience immediately cheered praises to God, chanting, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. With the nation again on his side, Elijah has all the prophets of Baal rounded up and executed. You'd think at this point... You remember the, what they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Does that sound familiar? The Lord, yes. It's in our prayer book. Which part? I don't know. Me'ila. Right before the end of Yom Kippur, Remember, we, we, we say something three times, seven times after we do the Shema once? There it is. The tides would turn and a wave of repentance would overwhelm the nation. But miracles hit people on an emotional level, and often, as soon as the emotion dissipates, so does that person's resolve. This is how Jezebel is able to watch Elijah's victory and respond, So may the gods do to you as you have done to my priests, and so this time tomorrow I will make your life like the life of one of them. Basically, she's saying she's going to kill him. And Elijah knows in a couple of days, the Jews aren't really going to care. So Elijah hightails it out of Dodge and goes into hiding once again. He names Elisha as the new top prophet and then appoints Jehu as the new successor and rightful heir to the throne. It's not long before Elijah dies. I use air quotes because many of the great rabbis in the Talmud believe he didn't actually die. The Book of Kings relates the story that one day, while walking with Elisha, a firestorm swirls around the two and a chariot of fire gallops down, welcoming Elijah aboard, on which he ascends to heaven. But like Loki, Jon Snow, or Wade Wilson, Elijah just won't stay dead. As a big part of rabbinic tradition, it's believed that Elijah still wanders the earth, helping those in need and attending every boy's circumcision. And when the Messiah comes, he will be the one to announce it. Not a bad gig for calling out an evil queen. In 853 BCE, while facing the mounting threat of the Assyrians, Ahab dies in battle. Amidst the chaos, Jehu, still glistening from Elijah's anointing oils, makes his claim to the throne of the north. First, he slays Ahab's son Jehoram with a well- Whoa, there you go, using another assassination by a king. ...aimed arrow to the heart, then sets his sights on Queen Jezebel. Despite her grief, Jezebel doesn't flee. She does her hair and gets made up all prim and proper as she overlooks the encroaching monarch. Was she trying to seduce the murderer of her son? Or did she just want to die with dignity and in fashion? Hard to say. But when Jehu arrives, she calls out for support from her most trusted and loyal eunuchs. What do you think the most trusted and loyal eunuchs did when she called out for help? They left. They, they left. They ran. They ran. As far as they could. No. No? No. Oh. Can it make one other guess? I don't know. Go ahead. Here it is. Who toss her out the window. Whoa. Then the horses trample on her corpse, and all but her hands, head, and feet get devoured by stray dogs. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which yeah, Elijah yeah. totally called to be a prophecy a few chapters earlier. Jehu eradicates Baal from all of Israel, as well as those golden calves of Bethel and Don. Though Jehu's actions were righteous according to the Bible, his kingdom would have trouble fighting off King Shalmaneser III of Assyria and Hazael, king of Aram. The kingdoms drag on for a few more reigns, but it isn't long before the northern kingdom was decimated piece by piece and the southern kingdom was conquered, leading to the first exile in 422 BCE. 
Unity has always been a bit tricky for the independent-minded Jewish people, whether wandering through the desert or debating politics of modern Israel. Or as Golda Meir put it so plainly to Richard Nixon, you are the president of 150 million Americans. I am the prime minister of six million prime ministers. They had a great moment of utopian unity at Mount Sinai, but within 40 days they had already had the golden calf debacle. Perhaps that explains the prophecy of Ezekiel that the nation's true long-term unity will only happen at the end of days. But despite the upheaval, the Jewish people of the great kingdoms of Judah and Israel never completely lost their bonds to their culture, history, pride, and a return to religious fidelity, even if it had to come about through exile. But you'll have to catch the next video for So, Carol. Yes, Andy. What do you think? I think it's an amazing story, and you know what? I would have never known, hearing the story, I would have never thought that Jews were killing other Jews. That's incredible to me. But I guess when you're trying to take over power, that's what happened. And what happened, of course, is we lost what? We lost Israel. We became refugees. We did not follow the world, the, the story of the Torah. And uh, there were so many additional things that went wrong. So in a moment, now I'm going to show you a positive side of Judaism and what happens when we all work together. And this will be our last one for, for this uh, discussion. So you know uh, Tel Aviv, right? I do know Tel Aviv. We, we've been there. A modern capital full of life. Yep. Do you know how Tel Aviv was formed and why it was formed? Something about dividing up the land. Yep, let's see something dividing up the land. All right, let's see. You probably don't know this either, and this is a more positive story about Israel. So let's see what we've got. The city of Tel Aviv as a commercial and financial center, bursting with startups and headquarters of major global companies. Or you may know of it as a cosmopolitan hub of culture and art. Or you may just know it as the party capital of the Middle East. So. How did a pile of sand dunes transform into the modern city of Tel Aviv we know today? The year was 1909, and the place was just north of the ancient city of Jaffa, a port that had existed for millennia and had changed hands between the Jews, Arabs, Crusaders, Turks, and other groups over the years. Jewish pioneers fleeing persecution and hardship in Europe purchased deeds for roughly 12 acres of barren sand dunes from the Ottoman Empire with the intent of creating the first modern Jewish city. Hoping to expand Jaffa and start a new and better life there, they founded the town of Tel Aviv. So how would you divide the land up if you were back in those days? How would you divide, divide the land that was available for Tel Aviv? I give a portion to all the families. Arbitrarily? No, I think we'd have to draw lots and see, or maybe whoever made the biggest donation or something like that. Oh, donations versus lots. Let's see what happened. The name itself meant Hill of Spring in Biblical Hebrew. It was also the title of the Hebrew translation of the utopian novel Alt Neuland, or Old New Land, written by Zionist leader Theodor Herzl. On that day, April 11, 1909, 66 families arrived on the shore of the future city, but needed a fair method of divvying up the plots of land among them. Akiva Arya Weiss, the president of the building cooperative they all belonged to, came up with the idea of a seashell lottery. He plucked 66 gray seashells and 66 white ones from the sand beneath their feet. Carol, you were right. Yeah. He carefully wrote it's the name of each lottery. family on a white shell and a number for a plot of land on each gray one. A 10-year-old boy paired them up at random and doled them out. The land was assigned and Tel Aviv was born. But how did it transform from sand to city? Enter Sir Patrick Geddes from Scotland, one of the founding fathers of urban planning. With the United Kingdom in control of mandatory Palestine, Geddes took an active interest in the development of the region. He had already designed the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in 1919, and in 1925, he had some fresh new ideas about how to construct the city. His design envisioned a garden city that laid out main roads intersecting with smaller side streets to create roomy residential blocks with lots of greenery and a communal garden in the center of each. This would combine a modern organized city with an open pastoral feel. Soon, the rapid development of the city would largely overwhelm his plan, although the layout Geddes designed can still be seen on the road plan today. Interest in moving to Tel Aviv caught on quickly, and the town swelled. Would you have moved to Tel Aviv in those beginning days, Carol? I guess if I was looking for a piece of land, and it would give them to me. With, ver I, I, with, with very few people there? That's how things start up. 
I remember when we moved to California, we moved to a city that was just, just developing. Right. Remember that? We were one of the few ones. And I did. We missed some investments there. Yeah. I got just a side note. There was a house that we didn't buy. This is way back when. A gorgeous home for about $45,000. We did not buy. We couldn't afford it. We were in our 20s. We couldn't afford it then. That house today, in our 20s, pardon me, in our 20s. I missed 20 and 40. I saw 40 on the screen. Anyway. So we didn't make the investment. We couldn't afford it. So we lived in an apartment and then we bought a house for like, I don't know, $37,000, a couple thousand more years earlier. My God, anyway, to the point, that house today, I looked it up, it's worth over a million dollars. Well, from a population of 2,000 in 1920 to over 40,000 by the end of the decade. That's an increase of 2,000%. And in the 1930s, the city really passed over the threshold of becoming a major city. Jewish refugees fleeing new waves of persecution in Europe landed in Tel Aviv and the town's population skyrocketed. With this influx of immigrants came culture, sport, and industry. Habima Theater Company was founded in Russia in 1917, but fled anti-Semitic persecution and moved to Tel Aviv in 1931, where it later became Israel's national theater. In 1932, the first Maccabi Games were held, an international Jewish sports competition aiming to shatter stereotypes about weak Jews. Tel Avivians proudly showcased the athletic and muscular new Jew. By the way, they still have the Maccabi games for kids today around the world where you have competitions and then you end up post-COVID and pre-COVID in Israel for the Israeli Maccabi games. Furthering the city's patriotic feel, 1936 inaugurated the first performance of the Palestine Philharmonic Orchestra with a rendition of Hatikva, the national anthem. And when the 1936 Arab Revolt cut Tel Aviv off from the port city of Jaffa in the late 30s, the city showed its persevering spirit, sending its first shipment of homegrown oranges to England's Buckingham Palace as a message that Zionism was still going strong. By now, the mid-30s, Tel Aviv had become a rapidly expanding city of over 130,000 people. The layout of the city also expanded. Architects educated wow. in the ultra-modernist German Bauhaus style moved to the city and gave the city its famous international look. They designed buildings that favored clean curves and lines without embellishments and focused on practicality, which made sense for a new and rapidly expanding city being built on a practically blank slate. Back Look at that, from a sand hill, all this in Germany, became the Nazi regime classified this style as degenerate art and shut down the Bauhaus school. And because so many Jewish architects fled Nazi Germany for Tel Aviv, the city came to host the largest Bauhaus. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? I want you to think back to that map that we saw with the first families and look at it now, and by the way, wait till you see pictures of modern district Tel Aviv. in the world, with over 4,000 buildings in this style. The Bauhaus district came to be known as Tel Aviv's white city and was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. All this new development helped to put Tel Aviv on the world map. The city continued to grow economically as well. In 1953, the Israeli Stock Exchange opened in Tel Aviv, establishing its role as the financial hub of the new state. Recently, Tel Aviv has been ranked in the top 25 most important financial centers in the world. Not bad for a city with a population of only 450,000. It's also a premier city for startup. So I want you to imagine the population of Tel Aviv versus the Jewish population of Palm Beach County, uh, Southern Florida, I should say, which is about a total of 600,000 businesses. In 2012, it was named the second best city in which to found a startup, coming only after Silicon Valley the number five spot on the 2019 Bloomberg Innovation Index and the number one spot for research and development. The Israeli government encourages this creative spirit with the number one spot in the world for research and development in 2019. That was just last year. The Israeli Innovation Authority, an agency that fosters invention in several industries. With so much business and development, it's the financial and international hub of Israel. Tel Aviv is also Israel's center of nightlife, entertainment, and, well, what you can really only call partying. On weekend nights, the city is lit up from the clubs in southern Tel Aviv to the crowded bars and sidewalks of Allenby, Ben Yehuda, and Dissingoff streets. And by the way, they all speak Hebrew. The city's coastal location is a prime facet of its social life as well, with beaches so popular that Tel Aviv is nicknamed the Ibiza of the Middle East. But despite the booming industry and social scene, Tel Aviv has its fair share of economic concerns too. It's ranked as the 10th most expensive city in the world, which is great for real estate value, but not so convenient for the people who live there or for those who would like to. In fact, the city, and Israel overall, has a fairly high poverty rate for an industrialized economy, meaning there is a significant wealth disparity. Immigrants and refugees looking for a new life helped found the city, but now, with such a high cost of living, it can be hard for newcomers to even get a foothold there. 
In fact, there were huge demonstrations in 2011 when hundreds of thousands of Israelis, Jewish and Arab alike, pitched tents on the streets alongside Tel Aviv's central. So we're going to stop for a few moments and kind of recap where we are right now and kind of do a nice little summary. So we started out by saying, where did Hebrew come from? And how did it become a spoken language? And I think we learned something. I know I did. You did I learned too. a lot of things. And then we learned, we compared Israel in 1922, was it, when Tel Aviv became formed, if I remember the, the year correctly, from just a sand dune with 66 families. And look what it is today compared to all the infighting, the idolatry, kings murdering kings, kings, uh, armies, coups, things you probably didn't know about the history because when we think back, and by the way, all that history is true, so there's no denying that. And we wanted to give, it, give you an opportunity to see Israel from several different viewpoints, the real Israel, the Hebrew, and the ancient Israel, and then to say, wouldn't it be wonderful if we all came together? It would be wonderful, no matter where you live, if we all came together. Yeah, we all came together because look what happened in the city of Tel Aviv. Look what happened to Israel. Look what happened to what a magnificent country it is. And yes, it is a secular Jewish country where there are religious factions. And as I've said many times before, I respect everybody's right to practice the religion the way they deem it for them. But let's take a look at this. There's no idolatry there. The Shabbat is still part and parcel of the culture, whether someone is secular or not. And the words of the Torah and the words of the prophet came true, that if in fact we unify ourselves and we do not practice idolatry, which was the downfall of ancient Israel, then Israel and the Jewish people would prosper and grow. So Carol, is there anything else that you would like to add? No, I think it's just been very enlightening because, you know, you hear about all the stuff, but you don't actually know how it was formed and who started it and all the history. I think it's fascinating. So I always like to end little uh, segments about Israel by saying, Am Yisrael Chai. The beauty and the nation of Israel. Chai, Israel, Yisrael. Am meaning nation. Chai means life. May we always live a healthful, wonderful life. So let's all stay healthy. Let's all stay happy. Let's all stay Jewish. You are? I'm Carol Greenberg. And I'm you are? Andy Greenberg. And we'll see you the very next time. Thanks for joining us on this journey. And we hope you enjoyed it as much as we did.